Okay, our next speaker is Nikki. Everyone knows Nikki. Nikki used to work for the uh, WWF for 11 years and then the Royal Society for four years, two of which she's been the manager of this project. I was reading her bio. One of the things she missed off of there, I think, is the most important, certainly from a volunteer and a, and a, and a beneficiary perspective. You can get hold of Nikki on the weekends and in the evenings via email <laughs> or phone, and that is a fabulous trait to have. Nikki's going to give us an overview on the legacy of RSU, the successes, the highs, the lows, um, and all the lessons that we can learn taking this project forward into, into the newer ones, such as the, the, the HLF project, which uh, Steve's involved in, and our own project in Wales uh, to, to build upon this. So thank you very much, Nikki. Thank you. Um, so rather than using a standard strap line for my talk, I've chosen the, the good, the bad and the ugly. I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions as I spin through my talk as to which one is which. Apologies to those of you who have been at previous, pairs, uh, previous fairs. You will probably would have seen a fair amount of this before, so I'm going to spin through this very rapidly. Obviously, as we all know, red squirrels are the only native squirrel species in the UK, and their populations have dramatically declined, as illustrated on the maps here. And the reason for that is the introduction of this little fellow, so the eastern grey squirrel, introduced from America in around 1876. As we know, they cause issues in several ways. So they're much bigger, they live in much higher densities, they outcompete red squirrels for food and habitat. And perhaps most uh, key, they carry the squirrel pox virus, which they carry with generally with no ill effects to themselves, but it's invariably fatal when it's transmitted to red squirrels. And although these maps are a bit out of date now, They've been around for quite a long time. They do illustrate quite starkly the decline in red squirrel populations, uh, particularly from the, the post-war years. So we also know work to conserve the red squirrel has been going on for many years um, across the UK. And what we aim to do through RSU was to bring some of those initiatives together um, and take a more united, joined-up framework approach uh, across the UK. So we're a four-year programme. Sadly, we're coming to an end. Um, we fin actually conclude at the end of March 2020, so we're in the throes of final reporting to donors and stuff. And we're funded through EU Life and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So we work across nine main areas in the UK. I have got a point, I don't know how well this will work. This could be about to go horribly wrong. Um, so up here uh, in northern England, so around the Kilda Forest stronghold, that's about an hour, I think, or so to the northwest of here. Um, down here in Merseyside, much more of an urban area. So uh, the island of Anglesey, northern Gwynedd, and Clacarnog Forest in North Wales, the Towie Forest down here in Mid Wales, and across the pond, four areas in Northern Ireland. So up here in the northwest, around Derry or Londonderry, the glens of Antrim in the northeast, the Mourne Mountains in the southeast, and County Fermanagh over in the west there. And these all represent some really different landscapes as well, some very rural, remote areas, hard to access, um, and also some very urban, much more urbanised areas. So we're working across a real diversity of, of landscapes. So our main aims, the first one was around tackling barriers to IAS colonisation prevention. That was mainly through the establishment of early warning and rapid response systems across the project areas. And that took a whole mixture of approaches, so mostly through things like camera trapping, visual surveillance and formal monitoring surveys, um, which took place throughout the project. Maximising the impact of grey squirrel control or eradication. So this was really taking that landscape scale approach, so big picture thinking, working across big areas um, and working strategically. Building community resilience was a, a really big aim of the project, so lots of community engagement, increasing volunteer groups, uh, community-led action, um, and increasing the number of um, volunteers involved. But also a big part of this was around communications and awareness. Uh, we've obviously illustrated some of the issues that, that we've had from parts of the community that don't necessarily agree with managing grey squirrels. Um, so part of this element in particular was getting out there, getting the message out there about red squirrel conservation. Lastly, aiding the development of comprehensive IAS management frameworks. So that's really through facilitating and sharing um, best practice, knowledge sharing, etc., through events like this, the Knowledge Fair, but also linking in with the broader IAS community um, in the UK, in Europe, um, and internationally. Uh, the monitoring, as I've already referenced, was a very big part of the programme. And these are actually a couple of graphs from... Uh, the Kilda Forest stronghold, where they were monitoring quarterly. And the aim in that area was really to protect those woodlands, uh, which are made up of Kilda, Kidland, and Uswayford, and to try and maintain them as being free from grey squirrels. 
And uh, we actually know that this was largely volunteer-led. Um, so 595 surveys were completed throughout the project, of which 433, uh, 433 were completed by volunteers. Um, and actually, that was 96% volunteer-led um, in July 19, which was the last survey that we ran in that area. So it surpassed the expected result target, which if you know the area, is really quite an achievement because it's really remote. It's miles from anywhere. You've got to travel a long way, um, and there isn't a very large human population there. It's also been shown that where grey squirrels are detected, obviously acting quickly offers the best chance of uh, protecting red squirrels. That was a challenge um, because there are two rangers working across that area, but responding quickly to grey squirrel incursion, grey squirrel detection with fairly limited resource um, was a real challenge in this area and Northumberland Wildlife Trust are now looking at ways in which they can improve that going forward um, and trying to work more closely with the Forestry England, um, who incidentally own the forest um, and should really be picking up more responsibility for the, for the management that goes on there. Yeah. <laughs> like that, thank you. <laughs> Looking across at Northern Ireland, um, they had an annual monitoring program, so this is the amalgamated data for three years. And as well as monitoring for red and grey squirrels, they also monitor for pine martin. Obviously, lots of research has been coming out of uh, Ireland in particular about the relationship between pine martins and grey squirrels. Um, the squares in question, basically the lightest colour in all of those squares, denotes where that particular species was, sighted, uh, was spotted in one year. The mid-range colours, so it would be the red for uh, the red squirrel, the mid-grey for the grey squirrel, and the light brown for pine martin is where they were spotted in two years running. And the darkest squares is where they were spotted in uh, across all three years. And in 2019, um, Ulster Wildlife, in partnership with a range of other organisations, also took part in the All-Ireland Squirrel and Pine Martin Survey. And the results from that aren't out yet. I think, I believe they do out imminently. So uh, hopefully in the next few weeks we'll get the results on that. Incidentally, red squirrels have also been downgraded um, in Ireland from and classified as near threatened to a species of least concerned. And I think it's the, the Irish red list for terrestrial mammals. I should have written the notes down because I knew I'd get that wrong. <laughs> okay, so that's it anyway. But obviously, whilst that's great on the one hand, um, we need to ensure that the pressure remains because obviously that could, you know, that could go south really quickly. I want us to actually have a look at County Fermanagh. So... This area around here um, in the west, because actually what County Fermanagh has is a lot of these guys, has quite a few of these guys. What it doesn't have is many of these. So it actually has the highest density of red squirrels and pine martin across Northern Ireland. It doesn't have many grey squirrels. However, it is vulnerable to incursion, I think, from uh, northeastern points of the county. Prior to RSU, there was no real early warning network set up uh, to detect incursion in the county. That's been set up through RSU, um, and also uh, Ulster Wildlife also facilitated the creation of, I believe, the first red squirrel group in the Republic of Ireland, um, the Donegal Red Squirrel Group, who are represented here today. Through the term of this project, four grey squirrels were detected um, in the county, of which three were removed over the lifetime of the project. Spinning on to Anglesey, I'm sure most people are well aware, Anglesey obviously the site of a, a big grey squirrel removal programme and was declared grey squirrel free in 2013. And as you can see from the map up there, it's separated from mainland Gwyneth uh, by the Menai Strait, a sea channel, but it's connected via these two bridges. And red squirrels migrated across to the Gwyneth mainland in around 2009, but obviously what goes one way can come back in the other direction. So in response to this, uh, Red Squirrels Trust Wales set up a community-based early warning network across the island where they've established more than 230 garden and woodland feeding stations across the island. And there are also cameras set up at key points um, on the mainland and island habitats adjacent to the Menai Strait. Um, they produce an e-book, uh, Red Squirrels in My Garden, um, which is really designed to empower the community with knowledge around red and grey squirrel ecology. Um, and they also developed a sea traffic protocol uh, in partnership with Ulster Wildlife and in consultation with Stena, the ferry company, to try and prevent greys or other invasive species being transported um, via sea traffic, um, like ferries, etc. So I think there have been six grey squirrels detected since 2015 through the early warning system, and they've been removed from the island. Obviously, 
Um, in terms of early warning and rapid response, early warning can also be used to, to look at general visual health of a population, but rapid response isn't just about dealing with grey incursions, it's all, also about how you respond to disease threats. And sadly, in Gwyneth in the autumn of 2017, squirrel pox virus was detected in Gwyneth um, red squirrels. And these were actually the first cases in wild Welsh red squirrels. The previous cases in the 1990s were from red squirrels that were released into the wild. So RSTW implemented their biosecurity protocols, removed feeders, they did a lot of public outreach work, and as there were a total of three confirmed cases. Drink. Obviously, when carcasses, particularly if squirrels are dying from squirrel pox, it's really important to remove them quickly from the environment because they can continue to shed the virus. But obviously, they're not particularly easy to find. So out of a conversation that was born um, out of a knowledge fair a couple of years ago in Bangor, um, Rachel from Lancashire Wildlife Trust and a few others got together and thought about how great it would be if we could train dogs to sniff out dead red squirrels. Um, dogs really, really well known, obviously, already for sniffing out um, explosives, drugs, um, but now really coming up the radar for use in conservation too. So there was a workshop in 2018 that was run um, in cooperation with Cryos Canine, and Max is now the first fully trained uh, red squirrel detection dog in the UK. And it's generally accepted that dogs are more effective than people um, at searching, um, partly because they possess, I think it's more than 220 million sense receptors in their nose. We only possess 5 million, so dogs are really effective. And this actually is something that's kind of migrated out across the project because we've now got detection dogs being trained over in Northern Ireland, and that's something that will continue post-RSU. And Cryos Canine are also working with the Orkney Native Wildlife Project, um, who are speaking here today um, for their state eradication project. Grey squirrel management. Um, obviously, grey squirrel control took place across all project areas, but there were two areas that were selected where we aimed to remove grey squirrels from the landscape entirely. And one was this area here um, in northern Gwyneth, and the other was the Mourns in uh, Northern Ireland. And they were chosen um, partly because of their defend defendability. Um, so both of them contain kind of coastal and mountain kind of boundaries. And obviously here in uh, Gwyneth, it's really important to protect um, the red squirrel population on Anglesey, but also protect the reds as they migrate, migrate out across Gwyneth. Now, sadly, the eradication uh, wasn't completely successful in Gwyneth. Grey squirrels are still in the landscape. Um, so RSTW have been exploring other approaches, um, including the Pine Martin reintroduction project, which I'm not going to say much more about because we have got to talk about that later on today. Um, they also represented two completely different landscapes because in Gwyneth you had a really high density of grey squirrels, um, so I think four full-time trappers and contractors um, aiming to remove them. In the morns, a bit different. Um, grey squirrels, not as ubiquitous across the landscape. Um, and different approaches were taken um, in terms of managing them. So greys are now pretty scarce in the morns, but obviously this isn't eradication to a fixed boundary point as such. So although you can see the, the line there that denotes the, the eradication and buffer zone, that's quite porous. So the area is still vulnerable to risk of incursion by, by grey squirrels. Um, so it's important to maintain vigilance for that going forward. There are several community groups active in that area who are obviously working to prevent incursion. Something else that Ulster Wildlife pioneered, many of you might remember that we had a full talk on this last year, so I'm only going to touch on this quite briefly, is the use of the Kenya 2000 trap. Now, not everybody's entirely comfortable with conventional cranial dispatch, um, so this is just another, another tool in the box, really. So you use your standard live capture trap, and then the Kanya 2000, it's a spring or kill trap. It's licensed for use with grey squirrels. And typically, um, it will be uh, placed on a tree or a fence. But these guys have used it slightly differently. So your squirrel is captured in the live capture trap in the conventional way. Your ranger, volunteer, comes along, attaches the Kanya to the end. The squirrel enters the trap. Bye-bye, squirrel. So, um, yeah, so they've, uh, they've taken that forward. They've actually also added a perspex window um, which you can see on the end here, and uh, that's deemed to encourage the squirrel into the trap more, but it's not essential. And just a point of clarity on this that is really important, the trap housing can be modified in this manner. You must not modify the trap itself, and to do so would contravene the spring trap approval trapping orders. 
um, and would make it therefore illegal. So, but essentially what this has done has increased the number of volunteers who are willing to undertake grey squirrel dispatch. And again, this is an approach that has migrated throughout the partnership. And I know our friends up in, in Scotland, um, certainly some of their staff, I don't know if it's passed out to volunteers yet, but certainly some of their staff have been using the Kenya um, along with other partners in, in RSU too. And it's just highlighting how the power of the partnership, if you like, can, can amplify different approaches that would otherwise perhaps remain just with one, with one body or one organisation. A big focus was to increase the number of active community groups. Um, and down in Wales, um, through the work of Becky Clues Roberts, uh, the Kokainog Red Squirrels Trust was established. Um, they're up and running. The Red Alert Group uh, in Merseyside has been uh, constituted and perhaps might be fair to say given a new lease of life. But what's great about these two groups as well is that they've actually been doing some work together. So the areas aren't ridiculously far apart and there have been a few exchange visits between those two groups. Um, it's a chance to get to obviously get to know each other but to learn and share experiences from each other as well. And that's been quite a powerful, a powerful uh, achievement for the project. Over in Northern Ireland, at the start of the project, there were seven active groups in Northern Ireland and through RSU, six new groups have been established or constituted, as you can see on the map, um, and as I referenced earlier, including the one in Donegal over in the Republic, so the Donegal Red Squirrel Group. We also hosted a couple of trap loan schemes. I believe there's trap loan schemes also in Northern Ireland. And these are two completely different trap loan schemes. So in Merseyside, the urban trap loan scheme now has 125 households participating in it, which represents a 145% increase in membership since the start of the project. And there's a network of Grey School control volunteers in each project area. And that actually makes a really good foundation for the Red Alert group um, to grow that and grow the membership of it going forward through community engagement and membership of the group itself. And if you go across to Mid Wales, um, they've got a rural trap loan scheme. Now, these areas couldn't be more different, really, if you tried. You've got one, obviously, around Merseyside, uh, much more urban. Um, Mid Wales, really remote. You know, huge, vast areas of forest down there as well. Um, their trap loan scheme's been running since 2014, so it actually predates RSU but they actually now have 119 volunteers or around 119 volunteers participating in the trap plane screen and 100 volunteers engaged in grey squirrel control. Community empowerment, excuse me. So a lot of this was, um, obviously a lot of people, particularly in the community sector, have been involved in this um, for a very long time. But a part of this was really around empowering people with the skills and knowledge, um, not just in red squirrel conservation, but in grey squirrel control. And we hosted over 250 training events, which predominantly were on um, grey squirrel control, but also focused on many different things too, whether that was sort of feeder building, monitoring, uh, radio tracking, for example. And we produced 15 best practice videos, some long, some short. Um, so we had one around detection dogs, one on detecting grey squirrels in red squirrel areas. Um, and one on squirrel pox virus. Uh, we've produced several best practice guides, as already has been referenced, one of which is this guide here, which is obviously contained in your goodie bags, and that contains case studies from invasive species um, operating all across the European landscape. We also secured strong regional and national press coverage, so there were several or multiple appearances on Countryfile, Countryfile Diaries, Springwatch, BBC Home Ground, um, and a lot of regional coverage um, and, and, say, national press coverage too. We hosted 600 community engagement events, engaging more than 60,000 60, people, um, and obviously we had regular project newsletters, blogs, annual reports, one of which, the annual, well, it's our final layman's report actually, is also contained in your goodie bag. Um, and these, I think, were really um, all provided opportunities for cross-sectoral knowledge sharing and learning, and they're all actually displayed on our Red Squirrels United website, which is live for the next five years, so you can actually access those at any given point. One thing I didn't touch on was the webinars. Now, this was an idea that came out of Red Squirrels Trust Wales back in January 2019, when... Um, the speaker that they wanted to invite for an event was up in Scotland. They're down in Wales. I'm obviously in the Midlands. So we were trying to work out how we could actually 
run this um, with, a, with a speaker who couldn't make it. So we decided to, to host it as a webinar. And that proved to be really successful. Um, so then we ran more webinars. And in total, we ran nine. Um, and we drew on uh, various um, staff members of RSU. But also, we got um, the volunteers involved in that too. Um, and it actually proved a really good way to engage people. Because people we, we held them in the evening so that people could participate. Um, you know, and you could you know, just log in from the comfort of your own home with your cup of tea or your gin and tonic or whatever and just uh, sit and watch, the, and watch the webinar. And they're all recorded again and, uh, and back up on the, on the website. Thank you. Uh, knowledge sharing and best practice. Obviously, I've already referenced the knowledge fairs. Um, a really great opportunity for coming together, networking. Um, but also, what's been flagged up to us, actually, was the that sense of you're not alone, actually. There are other people um, facing similar situations. Um, so that has been, uh, has been really powerful. Obviously, we did a lot of liaison with the, with the broader community, so disseminating project findings, um, but also conducting uh, project exchange visits um, and working with cross projects across the sector. Um, and we attended this conference in Slovenia back in September. Now, this was quite interesting through the Life Artemis project because Slovenia is one of the countries that's at risk of grey squirrel incursion because they're present in neighbouring Italy. It wasn't really on their radar, I don't think, um, and nobody in the Slovenian government was working on it. But I think after we attended the conference, it was a bit more on their radar than it had been previously. So it would be interesting to see how they take that forward. So in a nutshell, firstly... We uh, commissioned an independent evaluation, which also contained a cost-benefit analysis, which is where you aim to monetize uh, or put an economic value on all the benefits generated from the project. Um, and ERS, the company who conducted that for us, discovered that RSU generated total benefits of 11.5 million uh, for red squirrel conservation. That's based against a budget of around about 3 million. So that's a pretty good return on our investment, really. And, uh, and represents really good value for money. Volunteers contributed more than 44,000 hours with an equivalent value of £865,000. That's all you guys, um, or uh, yeah, the people who kind of fit under, fit under RSU. Forestry Act. So we discovered through the course of this project as well that actually if you're issuing tree felling licenses, you cannot put conditions on issuing tree felling licenses as they relate to flora and fauna. So uh, we weren't terribly impressed by that. And the Welsh Government have committed to reviewing their forestry legislation. Well, they've gone a bit quiet on that front recently. Um, the English Government will not follow suit, and they've been very categoric on that score. They don't see an issue with it. They don't see a problem with it. And it's unlikely to be amended at this point in time. We left a strong legacy, I think, for community groups. Obviously, we've got increased numbers of community groups. Um, volunteers' uh, numbers have increased. Um, not enormously, but uh, obviously, you know, we have more people coming on board. And perhaps the best news of all, we know that Red Squirrel's populations have remained stable across the project landscape, and they've increased their distribution across some project areas. So key lessons, uh, strong community support um, is essential, um, but also the community engagement aspect of it is really important. So trying to get people on board with the messaging and the issues that face Red Squirrels, Projects need to empower volunteers with the skills, equipment, and protocols, so ensuring that groups are really well supported um, through funded projects. And that's perhaps something that, you know, if we were to do it again, we would probably take a slightly different approach to that because it proved actually quite difficult to get some funding directly out to the groups um, because of our funding restrictions. Self-sustaining local volunteer groups were established, um, so obviously that provides a really strong project legacy. Local management approaches, obviously we worked across a whole range of different landscapes as I've illustrated earlier, so these, these really, you know, you can't take a one-size-fits-all approach with that, so we really had to look at how we're approaching things and tailor-make that to the different areas that we worked in. Obviously we successfully shared lessons across the EU and with other international projects, and perhaps most importantly, it takes time to build a partnership. You know, these pro big programs, you know, you're trying to pull them together, they don't just happen overnight, so you really have to put a lot of spade work in um, to obviously pull partners together, put those relationships in place. And that can be made more challenging when you've got an umbrella program like ours 
we all know it takes about half an hour just to explain the squirrel community and factions to anybody who's outside of the sector. So then you've got another thing that's sitting over the top of that that you've got to try and build your brand around. So that can be, that can be a real challenge and it's worth time investing in that. Uh, lastly, so in terms of what happens next, um, most partners, our issue, as we know, is coming to an end, and sadly there won't be another program on this scale um, moving forward. But most partners engaged uh, have either secured further funding, so Midwales have, um, have got funding for a further three years. There's a big partnership of the Northern Wildlife Trusts, which hopefully we'll hear about um, in the next talk. Uh, seeking future funding. Red Squirrels Trust Wales have been granted development funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Uh, the modelling data collected by Newcastle and the Public Attitudes Research um, conducted by Forest Research will be used to inform in future management programmes. And obviously Ulster will use this model uh, developed by RSU to develop appropriate responses to other IAS projects over there. So I think what it's important to note now is that I've really just given you a very small snapshot of everything that's been happening with the program. Um, and I can talk, and I could be here all day talking about this program, all the different things that we've done. But there are some things, obviously, that I haven't touched on, mostly because they're featured in talks later today. Um, but I hope that's just given you a bit of an overview of what we've done and what we haven't done and what we hope to do um, in the future. Thank you. Thank you.